Our scripture reading this morning comes from Joshua, chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites, and no one went out and no one came in. And then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days and have the seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. And so as we begin to look at chapter 6 of Joshua... Uh, we're going to be studying the walls of Jericho, and I know you've heard the story, but there's a lot of good stuff there that you may not know, and I hope you're going to be enlightened. But before we do that, let's uh, just humble ourselves before the Lord, ask His blessing uh, upon us. Lord, we just humble our hearts, we bow our heads, our knees before You to proclaim that You are Lord. You are Lord of this place. You are Lord of our hearts. We give you glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that just as you were with Joshua and the children of Israel, that, Lord, you were with us, that we have a relationship with you through Christ Jesus. Lord, bless us. Uh, bless us, Lord, as we seek to, to hear from you, to follow you, uh, and to march lockstep, Lord, with you to bring you glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Phil. Thank you, Rhonda. Look with me at Joshua chapter 6, if you would, please. Joshua 6. I was uh, reading, and I, a parent had taken their child, it was the first time they got to play football, and so they were third grade playing football, and, and evidently he had a pretty good game, and, and they just tell him how great he was, and he got a real concerned look on his face. He said, Dad, if the NFL drafts me, do I have to go? <laughs> so uh, sometimes we may not have the whole picture, but we, we understand kind of how things work, right? Right. And so we need to look at the scripture this morning and get an idea because what we're going to see this morning is that God keeps his promises. And you need to be reminded that because pretty much no one else does. God keeps his promises and he is so unique and so different that we have been uh, chastened or let down uh, or uh, maybe we've gotten uh, cynical or maybe mature uh, in our views, but we need to be reminded that as we look at other folks, or even ourselves, because how many times have you made a promise to yourself and let yourself down, right? Oh, don't look at me like I'm the only one who's ever promised myself. So uh, I promised myself I wouldn't eat all that Halloween candy, but God has forgiven me. So no, no connection there even with that? All right, I'm the only sinner here. Good to know. Now, Look at Joshua chapter 6 and verse 1. I want to talk about God keep his promises. We, we read earlier about, and starting in verse 1, now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites, and no one went in or out. No one went out or no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is so clear. Speak to our minds, speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, impact us with it that we could leave here changed, Lord, by your word. For we humbly ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So God tells Joshua, see, I've given Jericho into your hands. Into your hands. So here's the thing. When God keeps his promises, what he is saying to Joshua is, Joshua, I got it done. It's done. Notice, notice the scripture. Look at your Bible there. Jo the Lord said to Joshua, see, I will give. What does your version say? Have, have, have give. That's a past tense verb, right? In other words, it's already accomplished. In, the, in God's mind, he said, Joshua, I've given this to you, and this is accomplished. It's a promise I made, so it's done. 
Now, there are conditional promises that God makes, and there are unconditional promises. An unconditional promise says, it rests entirely on me, Joshua. What happens? Or Abram, or whoever God is making that covenant with. Conditional promises say that I'm going to bless you, I'm going to give you, and here you can have it, but if you don't fulfill your part of the promise or the covenant, then, then it'll be negated. It'll, it'll be null and void. Now, Joshua here hears from the Lord, and the Lord said, see, I've given it to you. And Joshua goes forward with the mindset, okay, God said it, so it's done. Let me ask you a question. When God promised you salvation, the Bible says that neither height nor depth angels or demons, the future nor the past, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus. That's in Romans 10. Nothing can separate. So when you made a covenant with God, when you surrendered your life to him, when you said, God, you can have me because I, I just can't get to heaven on my own, when, whatever it was, however you prayed, the, the sinner's prayer or whatever, when you made that covenant with the Lord, at that point, God made a contract, a covenant with you that is permanent and rests on him. It rests on you surrendering to him and him scooping you up. So that's a conditional on what God can do, not what you can do. That's really the, the reason the scripture says, height nor depth, angels nor demons, the future nor the past, the, fu- the present nor the future can separate us from the love of God. Isn't that great? Amen. That God knows the future, and he knows that nothing will separate those who have trusted him from that saving relationship with him. Joshua understands that God has made a promise, and so he's going to, God says, I got her done, Josh. Now, that was, I guess, if God was a redneck, right? And Joshua says, we're going to get her done, Lord, because look, look, look at verse 7. Joshua says, okay, God, you've given me the plan. He goes to the people, and he says, here's the plan. Here's what God wants to do. Remember, they're going to a great fortified city. They have no siege towers. They have no uh, weapons to, to knock down battering rams. They have nothing to knock down walls. It's the, the largest city in the promised land the most fortified, the strongest, and they have no idea how they're going to get that done. How are we going to knock these walls down? How, how do we, we don't have the, the, the skills, the abilities to do it. Lord, what are we going to do? Remember, they, they set themselves apart. They prayed uh, all that time. They, they made themselves holy before the Lord. They renewed their covenant before him. And now God says, okay, Joshua, it's time to go. Here's the promise. We're going to get it done. And here's how you're going to do it. And God gives him the plan. So in verse 7, Joshua says, we're going to get her done. And and Joshua says to the people, go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass before the ark. So Joshua says, here's what we're going to do. God has told me this, and I'm going to tell you what God says. We're going to follow what God says. We're going to do what his word says. He says we should march around the city. We're going to have uh, some soldiers in front, then we're going to have these, uh, these trumpeters, and then we're going to have the Ark of the Covenant, some more soldiers, and all the people are going to march around the city. Now, it's about, about eight acres or so. Uh, it's not too big to march around in a day, not a hard job, but not that big. But what's that going to do? Well, Joshua just says, here's what God says to do, so we're going to do it. So the, the, the people, the people of God say, well, God says he's got it done. Josh says we're going to get her done, and the people, the people do get it done. They're getting it done, but they're following the Lord. Here's the thing. When you follow God, the answer sometimes is yes. Sometimes in your prayer, the answer is no. Sometimes it's maybe. But when you follow and you're obedient to the Lord, it doesn't happen always at once. Sometimes there's a process in which God leads you through to get you where he wants you. So God is going to lead the people of God with the ark before him, in other words, symbolic of God, marching around, and they have to obey. The people have to follow and obey and do what God says. Now, if this was in a Baptist church, people would say, wait a minute, we're going to do what? We're going to march six times around it? And we can't talk the whole time? You mean the trumpets are going to be going the whole time we're marching around, but we don't get to say a word? I didn't vote for that. Who voted on that? What committee's in charge? Where's the marching committee? 
But God said, this is what we're going to do. And, and don't you know, there's some people that always know better that are like, you know, I've read a lot of books on how to conquer cities, and not one time does it say to march around there. In fact, I was watching on Netflix just the other day, or on the History Channel, and no time has they, unless you've got battering ramps and catapults and all those, you're not getting in that city. But they didn't vote on it, did they? Why? Because God said it, so they're going to be obedient to it. They're going to march around that city. But you, you know they had to be asking, now, why are we marching? And why do we have to be quiet? And how many days? Six days? What, one's not good enough? Well, evidently not. You know what's interesting? The Bible doesn't say why six days and then the seventh. It doesn't give any answer. It just says God said to do it, so we're going to do it. Can I tell you something? He is God, and if he says to do it, I have to do it. And not to get too fine a point, but if God tells you to do it, you have to obey him. You have to do what his word says. You have to be obedient to the Lord. If you want to see God work in a way, and in a significant way, as the children of Israel here do, obedience is what unlocks the power of God in their life. They march around that city. And it's a test. The first day, maybe not. The second day, maybe not. The third day, maybe not. About the fifth day, don't you know they're getting kind of tired? I think I'm going to call in sick today. Nope. Get in line with everybody else and march. Six days they're marching around. They have to be obedient. And you know what they're learning? They're learning that this thing is too big for us. They've marched around and they have looked at the... I mean, what else are you going to do? They're looking at the walls, right? And they're thinking, there's no way we're getting in. How many of us are going to die if we just charge straight in? Trying to climb up the wall, what can we do? It, they have to be running through all the ways and all the reasons that, that, that they... All the ways they can't get in and all the reasons they shouldn't even try. See, I think God gets them to the end of themselves... And they realize, okay, God, if this is going to really happen, it does have to be you. Because this is too big for us. When's the last time God let you run up something against something that's too big for you? Health? Relationship? Finances? Every day. When's the last time? What big, what, what's the Jericho in your life? So Joshua tells them, we're going to do it, and what we're going to do is we're going to fight God's way. Look at verse 20. Well, look at verse 14. Oh, look at verse 12, sorry. It's just all so good. Joshua 6, 12. Joshua rose early in the morning, and this is the first day. And the priests took up the ark of the Lord, and the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the ark of the Lord walked on and blew the trumpets continually. And the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord while the trumpets blew how? The trumpets blew what? Yeah. Oh, man. Continually. Those trumpets are going. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp, and they did so for how many days? Yeah. Those trumpets are going. Now, what that do, is doing is it's telling the people of God, this is too big for you. But you know what it's also doing? It is psychological warfare. God is letting the people of Jericho know it's coming. Remember when the spies went into Jericho and Rahab tells them, our hearts are already melting in fear and people run. And what do you think they're thinking? First day, trumpets. Second day, third day, they're just getting beside them. So what is going on? Why is this happening? And, and fear is beginning to well up, and fear paralyzes. So God is not only showing the children of Israel, hey, this may be too big for you, but not for me. He is letting the people of Jericho who are in rebellion to him, he is letting their fears grow and their fear of the Lord and the fear of God's people grow. There's a reason that God said six days and then on the seventh. He never spells it out totally, but we can see what it is, is the Holy Spirit is working. 
And he is moving, strengthening the people's hearts, and now he is strengthening the, the, their hearts that they're ready for it, and day seven is coming. So now that they've learned, okay, this is too big, we're going to have to fight God's way. And what is God's way to fight? Verse 20. So the people, they, they, they march around, and so the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown, and as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. So that all the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. It's a miracle. There's no other way around it. It's a supernatural working of God. That is the same God that you and I worship. God still does miracles. He still blesses his children when we're obedient. He still blesses us when we do what he has called us to do. Even when we get weary and tired of doing it. I mean, fifth day marching around. You know what the scripture I thought about is, is in Galatians 6, 9. It says, do not grow weary in doing good. For at the proper time, you'll reap a harvest if you do not give up. Isn't that great? Don't go reading doing good, because at the proper time, you'll give a harvest if you don't give up. Just, just keep marching. Keep doing If you're right where God tells you to do, if you're doing what he says, then he's working. See, he's working when we can't see it, but he's working. He's working on my heart, on your heart. He's working on those who are his enemies and those who he wants to save. Rahab and her family are hiding in her house at this point. Remember the promise to Rahab? The, the prostitute, he said, if, as long as everybody, the spy told her, as long as everybody's in this house with this red scarlet cord hanging down, anybody that's in there with you, they're safe. You just stay right there and you're protected. What do you think she thought day one, day two, day three? Her house is in the wall. Now, did all the walls fall down? Did, the, did, the, the, did her house, did she watch the part of the house just pull away? The Bible says the walls fell flat. See, when siege happens, people push the walls in. Under a regular siege, you push them in, you undermine them, and you push them in. But, but these, these go out, and the children of God go in to claim for God this city. But Rahab and her family are safe. When I said God keeps his promises at the beginning, he does. He made a promise to Rahab, because you have chosen me, I will protect you. God is faithful to those whom he makes a promise. God will be faithful to you. If he has made you promises in his word, it is true. And you can bank on it. Just like your salvation, just as I referenced earlier, that the point you made a, a covenant with the Lord about salvation, he's going to hold on to you. Now, there are times when I miss blessings in my life and you miss blessings in your life because we aren't obedient to the Lord. It doesn't ruin our relationship with him. It doesn't mean that we're, still, we're not his children, but we, we miss the blessings. And we'll, we'll see a little bit more about that next week uh, with AI. The, the city of Ai. But, but here, they learn we've got to obey the Lord and we've got to fight the way God fights. You know, it is crazy to turn the other cheek, isn't it? But what's that turning the other cheek stuff? What's this praying for your enemies? Hmm. What, what, what do you mean pray for my enemies. Now, in so doing, he says, you're heaping coals upon their head. In other words, you pray for them and you ask God to, to work in their lives because we never know when God may turn enemies into saints. We never know when a Saul will become a Paul and God may do something great. And so our job is to pray and to ask. But in this case, God said, Nope, you go into jo you, Joshua, you take those children of Israel, you go in and you wipe them all out, everything. Nothing left because there's a corruption here, there's a sin here in this place and I don't want it to taint the children of God. So we learn that God keeps his promises. We learn that, that God says, hey, it's done, Joshua. It's in the past tense. Do you know that when you look at the scripture that you're saved, that you are being saved and you will be saved, all of that is covered in the scripture. There's different verses that talk about all of that. I like it, the scripture that says we are saved to the uttermost. Isn't that good? 
And I quoted it to you earlier, but when it says in Romans, it says, neither height nor depth, angels or demons, the future nor the past, or anything else, uh, all, all creation can separate us from the love of God. Anything in creation. Do you know what? Were you created? Some of you aren't sure. <laughs> you were created by God, weren't you? Right? So can you mess up so bad that God won't love you? If you've trusted him for salvation, if you've really put your faith in him, well, no, because once God saves you, he's not going to let you go. God saves Rahab. He has trusted her, and, and he doesn't let her go, because look, look what it says in verse 17. It says, and the city and all that was in it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only... Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Look at verse 25. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all belong to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Isn't that great? To this day. Now, I've mentioned in a previous sermon that she's in the line of Jesus. I mean, just to prove the point that she's not only saved but becomes part of that community, that God said, Rahab, the prostitute, is in the line of Jesus. Isn't that great? There is no one beyond his redemption, no one beyond him saving because he saves to the uttermost. But all of us are going to face a Jericho in our life at some point, and we have to remember what Joshua did. First, we have to remember, Lord, this is bigger than I am. We have to be humble enough to say, God, I can't do this. Secondly, we have to say, God, I'm willing to be obedient to whatever you tell me to do to have victory over this. Because I love you more than I love anything. That I, that certainly, God, you're bigger than this problem. And, and thirdly, we have to remember that God's promises are already done. They're in the past tense, he has promised for you that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life that will stand before him. Jesus said everyone who's given up houses and lands, fathers and brothers, mothers and sisters, anyone who's given those things up that will be more than rewarded in the age to come in heaven. Hmm. In other words, when God becomes number one, everything else falls into place. For Joshua, it took humility. For the children of God, it took obedience. And for Rahab, it took faith to trust that that they were coming for her, not to destroy her, but to save. Now, Rahab probably thought, it's over. Her whole house just went, (laughs) the outside walls. You see how doubt and fear and all that, but they were faithful and God was faithful. Friend, I don't know what you're facing. Beloved, I don't know what, what, what stress or what trial but God's bigger. And we're going to be obedient to him and to his word. Amen? Amen. Not because the preacher said, but because God's word says. Amen? Amen? He will make promises to you. And if you claim those promises and you hold to those promises, if you don't grow weary in doing good, but believe that God said at the proper time, Lord, we're going to see a harvest, then Lord, I'm not going to grow weary in doing good. I'm going to be faithful. And Lord, give me the strength because I can't on my own. See, the children of God knew they couldn't do it on their own. I I guarantee you, after a couple of days marching around and looking at that giant wall that they couldn't get up or over and seeing those soldiers on the top with their their spears and, and their helmets shining in the sun, it's too big. And God said, of course it is, but I've already given it to you. And Joseph says, It's ours, we're going to take it. And the children of God said, we're going to believe and obey. And they did. And there's nothing special about them that's any less special about you. God will give you the victory. Praise the Lord, amen? Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that, that, Lord, when we have struggles and we have things, that, Lord, as we go to to, to claim the promises that you have for us, just like the children of Israel went into the promised land. Lord, it was promised to them, but God, you did your part, and they did their part. They believed, and they were obedient, and they followed you. 
Lord, I, I pray that we too could believe and be obedient and follow you. I pray for those here, Lord, who are facing a, a trial or, or something that just seems too big and they've seems like they've been marching around it longer than six days. Lord, we, we just lay that at your feet. Whatever that Jericho is, whatever is so big, Lord, you are bigger. Lord, whatever uh, the world uh, can do to us, Lord, you are greater. Lord, we, we fear only you and only disappointing you. So, Lord, we ask that you would cleanse us from our, our sinfulness and help us to, to build boldly, Lord, march with you. Help us, O oh Lord, not to grow weary. Praise you, Lord. Praise you that we will see a harvest a harvest, Lord, if we do not give up. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just fill us and strengthen us. For I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask you to stand as we sing a hymn of invitation. Um, this time is for you. If you'd like to be uh, prayed with, I'd be delighted to pray for you. Uh, maybe you'd like to know Christ as Savior, that you've realized, you know what? Life is bigger than I can handle on my own, and I need to trust Christ as Savior. Uh, if you've never done that, then I, this time's for you. You come as we sing. Uh, perhaps you want to make this a, a, a church home, a church family. You know, the, Joshua didn't, he didn't fight the battle of Jericho by himself, right? Uh, he, he, had a, he had all the children of Israel with him. There are some things that you can do by yourself and some things you can't. Amen. So you come, you do business with the Lord. We give these last three minutes or so to the Lord. You, you, stay, you stay and do business with God as we sing. All right, you may be seated just for a moment. Um, we have one that comes to say that she wants to have First Baptist as her church home. And so uh, Leslie is frantically filling out paperwork, but you can, let, you can set it down. We'll do that later. So... Uh, Leslie, we, we uh, always have somebody assigned uh, a deacon uh, and his wife assigned to new members to pray for them for the next two months. And so um, we're going to uh, ask uh, for Leslie to come up um, and let that, uh, if that uh, deacon, uh, Bob and Lawan, okay, Dixon, if, if they want to come down. And, uh, um, but uh, Leslie has trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. Uh, and has uh, followed him, believes baptism, but wants to make this her church home. And so, uh, if you'll welcome her, say amen. And we've been ministering uh, to her and, and for her for, for quite a while, so I'm, I'm glad that you're making this your church home. Um, this is uh, Bob and Miss Lawan, Mr. Bob and Miss Lawan, and, uh, and they're going to, they'll be your prayer warriors for the next uh, couple months, so that's always a good thing, so... Uh, so would you stand? Um, now, I'm going to ask you to do something that's kind of a little different. We're going to have a, just a quick special call business meeting after everybody comes by and shakes her hand. So you can come by, shake her hand, run to the restroom if you need to, and then run back if you're a church member. Uh, we got something out of order in the business meeting last time, and so we're just going to correct it uh, this time. Uh, and I'll explain that to you in the business meeting. So, uh, But um, Brother Bob, will you close us in prayer, uh, please, sir?